Hello again. I often ask you guys for RimWorld video suggestions. The only problem is, most of what I get is terrible. So today we're going to play some of those ideas for about 100 days on Randy Random Blood and Dust, which is not too bad a difficulty setting, but most of these are deeply, deeply non-optimal ways to play the game. So most of them probably won't make it to 100 days, but we're just going to play them and find out. Because you never know, there might be one or two gems hidden amongst the steaming pile of shit. Suggestion 1 is, um... LOG Honestly, kind of starting with a banger. Using only wood as weapons, as in just straight up... Logs. It's a bonk colony, so we'll go with a tribal start. Five tribes people who I've created an appropriately wooden xenotype for, which should help them survive just a little bit longer than they would as baseline humans. Okay, the boys spawn in and start building themselves a little structure to live in and then they each equip the only weapons that they'll ever know before lining up nicely for you. Raven, Oyster, Humps, Ostrich, and Toxos. Five big hard wooden men with logs, ready to take on the world. They all have an at least decent melee skill because otherwise we wouldn't get anywhere. Within a day or two there's a neat little farm, an admittedly rough sleeping space and somewhere to keep all of the stuff. The logs are a psychite dependent race, so I set them up a drug policy to have two cups of psychite tea a day. I just thought it would be helpful for these guys to feel a little less pain whilst they're trying to beat down raiders with logs. Speaking of which, here's three Neanderthals with their fancy pants manufactured weaponry. I'm not really sure what we can expect here. The only thing I know for sure is that we've got to gank the one with the bow. Okay, so combat takes some time, killing mostly via extreme bruising. The knife-wielding maniac made it to base whilst their friends were being bonked to death. So now alone, they're an easier target for Oyster, who, wielding his wood professionally, destroys her head. So that actually went okay. The logs, when deployed in numbers, can sort of stunlock people for the most part. However, I think the smartest thing we can do here is rush towards the heaviest armor possible. That's the only way we're going to survive once people with guns start showing up. The next trial the logs face is a hungry grizzly, hunting for humps. At this point most of the boys are in plate armour so I tentatively send them in to give the bear what for. And after some most expert bonking, it goes down. Fantastic. Once more I'm beginning to think that this actually isn't a terrible idea. Anyway, the boys start exploring the basics of religion and then some impids show up. A slightly more worrying foe, what with all the fire. And whilst Raven got a little burned, he'll be fine after some rest. Eventually, the impids go down. But Randy isn't finished, because shortly after the impids, some Tox folk show up. And two of them have revolvers. Everyone but Toxos has full plate armor, so out they go to see what they can do, locking the two gunslingers into the bonk zone as quickly as possible. Humps takes a bullet right in the heart, but is rather surprisingly fine after being patched up in the field by Raven. He's then tasked with mashing up a load of feral monkeys with his log, a task he performs most admirably as ever. Okay, so with that slew of threats dealt with, the base is progressing nicely. We've discovered electricity to light the place up and start thinking about improving our situation with a fridge, you know, the basics. But this is interrupted, as usual, by what I would describe as a moderately concerning number of Neanderthals. These guys don't really bring anything capable of getting around the plate armor, but during the grand bonking, given the sheer numbers of Neanderthals, one gets bored and lights our crops on fire. In turn, catching themselves on fire. Not a great strategy. I sent Toxos the unarmored to deal with him, and before too long, all was quiet once more in the land of the logs. A mech cluster with a psychic suppressor sets up nearby, which is pretty rude given that we're barely two seasons into the colony, but upon further inspection, it's tuned to female, meaning our giga-chad bark-skinned men are completely unaffected. But it's time to build a wall. We'll still be using exclusively logs, no traps or turrets, but I want to at least be able to control where the combat happens. So after a few days of building and buying a samurai helmet for ostrich, we're walled in and generating a decent amount of sustainable power through water mills. I like this base. It's been 50 days and this idea is turning out way better than I'd have expected. And then the pigs arrived. With their Molotov cocktails and shotguns. 
Okay, so I, I guess that's about the limit of log weapon only corny. It's honestly a fun challenge, and maybe I'm missing something, but I'm not sure it can go much further without a load of specific mods to make it easier. Next! Suggestion 2. Like and subscribe. W wait, no. Suggestion 2 is the sapling baby. Another one I got a lot, rather predictably, is that I continue the story of the planted sapling child from the end of my Taokai video. I don't think this is going to go well, but sure. Let's see. First, we have to sit here and watch the empty base for 15 days. Thankfully, the automated defenses were able to keep the plant baby safe. But, um... Yeah, dryads can't breastfeed. Being a phytokin, if they were left outside, they'd actually be okay. Not happy or healthy, but they at least wouldn't starve. But Sequoia's left-behind companion dryads were kind enough to put little Chen into bed, where she'll slowly starve to death. Okay, next. Okay, so suggestion three is, um... Well, it's to build a shelf. I mean, it's, it's not really... It's not really a rim work. Uh... Alright, so first things first, you're gonna need some wood, a bag of nails, and whatever this thing is. I don't... I have no idea. I've never seen it before. But if you plug it into the wall, it does this. Which seems useful. Okay, so these bits of wood, if we just, um... If we just, uh... We assemble them... Like, uh, something like that, then, uh... Then that's a shelf. Obviously. Right, so... Uh, if we just use this thing to put the screws into the wood here, like this... Like... Like, yep, nearly, almost. Like, uh, like that. There you go. Uh, they should be, uh, they should be sticking out of the back. That's, that's how you know they're done. So if you just do that a few more times, um, then, then you're ready to grab the 660 Ti that we set aside earlier. It, uh, it doesn't need to be an MSI, but they taste best in my experience. So you take your Velcro strips, Stick one to the wood and then use the other to mount the 660. Press it on real firm. And then you give the whole thing a quick bash and a whirl and, uh... Shelf? Shelf. Yeah. Yeah, that's a shelf. I I've seen a shelf before and it looked... something like that. Um... Yeah, shelf. Wait, do you think they meant in RimWorld? No, I'm, I'm pretty sure they meant this. Well, somehow that was the, the best suggestion so far. What's next? Suggestion four is the good old breeder cult. The gist is that I have a single male colonist and a number of ladies for him to produce a load of children, otherwise known as free workers, with. Now, whenever I read these suggestions, my mind goes to cave dwellers for some reason. So the rather inappropriately named rubber will live in the dark under a mountain with his four women. After getting a little ways into things and naming the place Cave That Smells Really Awful, because it probably does, we have our first pregnancy. Becca is knocked up, so we'll quickly swap in Jet to spend her nights with Rubber. Wait. Nope. Abort! Abort! She's his mum! Abort mission! Okay, he'll actually be sleeping with Crystal now. I didn't realise that our esteemed patriarch had brought his mum along to help start his genetic dynasty. Oh well. A little while later, we'll dig further into the mountain to try and give people proper bedrooms. The idea that every bedroom will have a double bed and rubber will just rotate between them as pregnancies occur, it's very efficient. And in case you were wondering, yes, we are getting raids, but there's insects on the map, so they've all just run into them and died so far. The last raid though, a group of pigs, managed to destroy the hive, so that'll be the end of that. Crystal becomes the second pregnancy, and we're building a nursery for when the babies start flowing, but that's a while off yet. I'm basically just playing an almost entirely normal tunneler colony right now. There's nothing particularly interesting about it, and I'm not sure there ever will be. But okay, a season or so into things, here's our first baby, little Ayano, who will lay in a crib and just generally consume time and food for the next few years. So skipping ahead to autumn, the stinky cave is getting comfy. They've got all the creature comforts. A poker table, shelving, turrets. There's not a lot for me to do now other than wait for babies. Everyone that can be pregnant is pregnant. 
An infestation appears in the caves, but it's simple enough job to pull them towards the base defenses, and shortly after it's time for another baby. Crystal gives birth to little Alberic, who will join Ayano in generally being useless for a very long time. To fill that time, I've built a small hydroponics area and thrown a drug lab into this large workshop space. So, um, yeah, this is boring, but hey, here's little baby Genji. Oh. So it turns out when I'm bored, I just start painting the floors. The poker area looks great. The lighting is a bit clinical, but what can you do? The bedrooms, or whatever you'd call them, breeding zones, are a bit nicer too now. And I'm starting to work on a large combined barracks and classroom for the kids, if they ever grow up. But sure enough, Ayano finally does. Just over a year into the colony, we have our first child labourer but all they can do is clean and haul for another few years. At this point I'm so bored that I just set the camera to follow her and started playing my guitar. I built a little growth lab to at least speed through the baby part of childhood, and some squirrels had a surprisingly good go at fighting the local mechanoids. More babies happened, one of them killed Crystal on the way out, we named the baby murderer and held a funeral for her, so yeah, now after 100 days that's gonna do for this very, very boring idea. You could make a better run of this with a whole heap of mods and genes and so on and so forth, but the basic idea is just so very boring. Next! Suggestion 5. Toxic world where sometimes whenever something dies it explodes and explosions are 30 times bigger than they should be and you are slow down times 3. Ok, let's scale that one down just a tiny bit. Toxic world where everything explodes on death. I think we can do that. A group of three naked wasters, randomly chosen, find themselves on a horrible planet almost entirely polluted, where everything that dies explodes in a fiery manner with a 5 tile radius. I thought I'd make them cannibals, but then remembered that won't work on account of the corpse thing. Instead, they'll be transhumanists so that whenever they can manage to grow something, it can just be turned into paste. There's no trees here, so we'll immediately mine some steel to make a stonecutter bench with, and then use that to build a small stone shelter next to this tiny patch of unpolluted soil, in which we'll desperately try to grow some sustenance. We brought literally nothing with us. Um, we can't hunt, and there's nothing edible to forage. So from the first visitors that pass by, we'll buy some meals. But Randy is feeling a bit kind, as he drops 160 cougar meat from the sky for us, and then gives us a breeding pair of cows. That's very kind, Randy, but I don't know how I'll feed them. Anyway, we have our first mental break. Rubout is having a sad wander, and yes, wasters have very strange names. Whilst she's doing so, a Wookiee with a knife shows up looking for trouble so Pansy will quickly smash together a steel club and head out with Tony to break the Wookiee's knees. They did a pretty good job. I mean, Pansy got her finger cut off, but that's not too bad. And now Tony has a knife too. But there's been this mega scarab hanging around the base, just eating our very precious food, so let's quickly gang up on it. Oh, right, I forgot about that part. Okay, this is a bad idea because I personally failed at it and that makes it a bad idea. That's how this works. If you don't like it, go play the game yourself. Okay, what's next? Suggestion 6 is no porn left behind. As in RimWorld porn, not pornography. Um, this one is interesting because it's close to the exact opposite of how I usually play the game. We have to recruit, accept, tame, or just generally acquire every porn possible. I'm going to say that includes at least trying to save everyone who's not killed in raids. Barely a day into this colony, our first new friend shows up when a wild man named Alderley wanders into the area. We're legally bound to try and tame him, so off sister goes to do just that. And miraculously, she got him on the first try. Very good. So, immediately up to five colonists, and here come some more. A Neanderthal raiding party. We'll get building a small prison cell whilst Newt goes off to gun them down. Try as he might though, he couldn't save any of them. Buckshot is rather disruptive to the normal function of a human body, and the damage is hard to undo in a hurry. But oh well, there'll be more. Which is why I've started making a large room for a barracks. Eventually we'll make bedrooms, but early on an impressive barracks will do. Some pig folk raided next, but they ran into a trader and got themselves killed. Again, Nuke did try and save one, but it didn't work out. 
We're making an efficient building for food production, storage and consumption when a Wookiee falls from the sky. Into the little prison Marjot goes. And shortly afterwards his friends arrive looking for trouble, which they find comes at them rather quickly from the end of Nuke and Aldele's shotguns. Both are captured but only one can be saved. Hoakya. So anyway, now we've got a decent little kitchen, fridge, dining room, barracks and we're making a small workshop when another raid arrives. Toxfolk. After giving them the usual treatment, only one can be saved, a depressive genie named Monica, who's going to be a real pain in the ass later. You'll see. Some of the raiders are unwaveringly loyal, meaning they can't be recruited, by the way, in case you wonder why I occasionally leave some to die. The first of the Wookiees is recruited and immediately goes to work trying to recruit their former cellmate Monica. Before too long, the other Wookiee is recruited, growing the colony to seven now. We'll expand that even further by taking this quest to build a small monument with Princess as a reward. Vlad has it built pretty quick and here she is, bringing the population to eight. Looking to bring us to nine are the local Impids, who arrive in quite large numbers and attack from all over the place. A quite annoying but not particularly difficult defense. Okay, actually Hoakya came pretty close to dying at the hands of a particularly skilled bowman, but she'll be fine. Unlike most of the Impids, only one of whom made it. Bacchus. Monica the depressive genie is recruited now and starts her life's work of generally being a drag to be around. But anyway, okay, it's been 30 days and we've got nine colonists. The base is getting large, with a perimeter wall and a large farm to try and feed everyone. In construction now is a bedroom complex because people are quickly going to become unhappy, even with a really lovely barracks. Shortly before this is finished, another quest comes in. Drew is being chased by 22 Cobras. Well, I'd rather not deal with that many snakes, but we've got to try and save them. Here come the Cobras, which are gunned down pretty easily. But uh, they did get to Drew first though, whose peg leg meant that she wasn't able to make it to safety in time. Bad luck Drew, but we tried. We make her a sarcophagus and hold a funeral for this poor woman we didn't know. And then Bacchus the Impid joins the colony which is named Sardine Tin, by the way. Predictably, it's quite hard to feed this many people so early in the game. We'll definitely need hydroponics a little later, but for now, larger fields will simply have to do. Randy knows this and spikes me personally with a blight. What a dick. Thankfully, we've been able to feed ourselves with the local camel population, and now we've got two geothermal generators online, which should be more than enough to sustain some hydroponics. Some more Wookiees raid, two of which are captured, and then immediately afterwards the Tox folk show up for a siege this time. Well, alright then. Without mortars of our own, we'll have to go and face them before they can start doing anything rude with theirs. Which is where you'll see the vicious side of combat extended. Something not often felt in my videos because of how I usually play. These guys have got heavy SMGs, assault rifles and shotguns, and they put them to pretty good use gunning down Bacchus and seriously injuring everyone else involved, forcing us to fall back to cover and wait for the shorter ranged enemies to rush into our shotguns. After they've been made to flee, immediate medical care is delivered to Aldele, who wasn't far from death, and then we can turn to the raiders, only managing to capture one, a waster called Crusher. Bacchus couldn't be saved and gets his sarcophagus back at base. In the commotion I forgot to hold a funeral for him but Sister and Scott are getting married anyway so that'll keep everyone happy for now. As will the fact that pretty much everyone has a bedroom now. Things are starting to look up generally. With potato and corn harvests, the fridge is pretty full and our Wookiee prisoners have become lovers in captivity, which is very sweet. And then Randy says fuck you and kills all my crops with a cold snap. Nice one. Anyway, one of the Wookiees is recruited and then, as if we needed it, Sister is having a baby. Named Ben turning the population up to 11. So, moving on. Hydroponics. Lovely potatoes. And just a little psychite for the wasters. Having been here for about 60 days now, the mental breaks are beginning. People are upset about all manner of things, from breakups to bedroom jealousy. A lot of which is catalyzed by Vlad, who goes through girlfriends at an alarming rate. What a heartbreaker. Another wildling wanders onto the map pig person named Ruffle, so I sent one of the Wookiees, Windurul, who has an 18 animal skill, to go and tame her, figuring that would be an easy success, but nope, he's angry about being hand-fed potatoes and has turned violent. Nuke has the solution to this. 
For the crime of gunning down a wild pig, the karmic engine of the universe bestows a plague on our colony, afflicting five people. But we're way too early game for this to be a threat. They'll all be fine and immune in no time. Monica, on the other hand, is not fine. She's opened up one of the sarcophagi and pulled out poor Drew. The one that was killed by a horde of cobras earlier. Come on, Monica, she suffered enough in life, put her back. So, yeah, Monica the depressive genie is well and truly on the struggle bus. She proposed to Vlad, who rejected her, and then broke up with her shortly afterwards. And something I didn't realise earlier is that Aldele, the wild man we tamed earlier, is somehow Monica's son. The relations that Rimworld generates don't always make sense, but I'm only bringing this up because Aldele's head just got eaten by a hungry cougar. I'm sure that will help to stabilise Monica's mood. So we hold a funeral and then Duyish, one of the Wookiees, has a little hairy baby before the Toxfolk arrive for another siege. This time though, we have our own mortars, and after a few shells hit, kind of somewhere remotely near their target, they run at the colony and get gunned down. Three of them are plopped into the prison and patched up, before being joined by Chili, Vlad the Heartbreaker's brother, who crash lands nearby. Monica, still reeling from the incredibly shit lot she's been handed in life, is now binging on Psychite, downing about 30 cups of Psychite tea. I guess it's a good thing we didn't have anything stronger. And then three of the prisoners go for a break, figuring I wouldn't just gun them down like animals. They were wrong. That's exactly what I did. And, um, Chili died, which won't exactly make Vlad happy, but that's just how it goes sometimes. He'll get over it. Monica, on the other hand, will not get over it, and is binging on food this time. I don't think there's much I can do for her, she's just gonna be like this for a long time. Oh, and here's the threat we've all been waiting for. A mech hive raid. Quite a scary group of mechanoids. Whilst waiting for them to start their attack, Vlad will quickly put a little baffle at the entrance to the kill tunnel to force them into range, and Monica, between mental breaks, will hastily throw together some AP ammo for the SMGs. And the gang made a pretty good go at it, dealing with the Lancers just fine, but as soon as I saw this little guy aiming around the corner, I knew it was all over. All of our armor-piercing capabilities are now on fire and running around in a panic. But hey, that was fun. It's nice to play with a lot of colonists for a change. And obviously, this could have worked out way better. I never even researched turrets because I was just enjoying doing other things. But they made it to 90 days regardless, so not too bad. Anyway, what's next? Suggestion 7 is that you leave me more ideas in the comments below and subscribe if you want to see more weird content like this alongside my usual RimWorld stories. It was a lot of fun to record and honestly gave me some decent ideas for actually good colonies. Whatever you do though, please remain indoors. It's not safe outside. There's big angry men with logs out there. So thanks for watching and until next time, goodbye.